Uh, we're reconvening after a nice morning. Uh, for those of you who are just arriving uh, new for the afternoon, um, I'm Ken Coleman. I'm the director of the International Institute. Uh, we've already had st uh, stimulating presentations and discussion. Uh, we're, in, we're here to talk about the future of islands, uh, and a lot has already been said. Uh, we have two speakers this afternoon. Uh, and the first one is Susan Najida. She's an associate professor of Asian Pacific American Studies, uh, American Cultural Program, and associate professor of English Language and Literature here at the University of Michigan. And we'll get started. The ground rules for those who are new is uh, the speaker will talk for a half hour, give or take some. Uh, there will be a discussant or two, depending on the speaker, uh, for 10 minutes or so. Uh, each and then uh, open it for discussion. We have a little bit of flexibility, especially on the second uh, presentation, because uh, we have two discussants, and this should be fun. So, welcome, welcome to everybody. Since the paper came to you at 3 a.m. this morning, <laughs> I'm going to assume nobody's read it. <laughs> um, um, I hope this essay, this uh, paper will help us to think about some of the things that were broached in the morning session. Um, specificity, intense specificity, um, living and non-living entities. Um, and this is not a history paper, so we're branching outside of the range of history uh, to literature and other things. And, um, and then to talk about a little bit about agency, and in this case, less about agency and more about r relate, um, forms of belonging, reciprocal belonging. Um, so this, pr this paper privileges high volcanic islands of Oceania. Nevertheless, the relationships between living organisms that this paper elaborates will and are undoubtedly being affected by global climate change, including rising sea levels. What the islands can teach us about the relationships between organisms stands to contribute to and intervene in the future of environmental thinking, but only if we can acknowledge the material relationship between concepts and the very island ecosystems that inspired and sustained them. In other words, this is not meant to be an extractatory essay that distills genealogy for the use for use by others far away from the islands. And, um, but it's not meant to be contained to the islands, right? I wish I had time to share some of my work that responds to John Gillis's challenge to us to think ecotonally the relationship between uplands, rivers, streams, down to the ocean. In Hawaii, we call these ecotonal systems ahupua'a, which extends from the mountaintops through the valley, streams down to the shore, and even into the shore and the springs that up well um, in the shore areas. Okay, so I'm going to begin with a quotation by Mary Kavena Pukui from her essay, Songs of Old Ka'u Hawaii. She says, the Hawaiians were lovers of poetry and keen observers of nature. Every phase of nature was noted in expressions of this love and observation woven into poems. In his seminal essay, Our Sea of Islands, the late Epelihau Ofa conjured for his students and future students of the Pacific a new Oceania. He countered long popularized imperial notions of the region as so many exotic paradises, as stepping stones to Asia, as Pacific basin, sink, toilet, for the major Pacific Rim powers to control for their own economic and political purposes. That was 20 years ago. Recently, as sea levels rise at the rate of three millimeters per year, threatening the very livelihoods and life-giving properties of the islands, development experts draw attention to the plight of islands by offering up the ocean itself, which covers about a third of the Earth's surface area, larger than all of the planet's combined land area. And they offer it up as a carbon sink. The region itself struggles with its own energy dependency, with 90% of its needs being met by imported fossil fuels. Nevertheless, Haofa's grassroots vision of, the, of what the Pacific is and could be 
was inspired by scenes of grandeur. While driving what he called his road to Damascus, the southern road on Hawaii Island, called the Big Island, where he witnessed, quote, this eerie blackness of regions covered by recent volcanic eruptions, the remote majesty of Mauna Loa, long and smooth, the world's largest volcano, the awesome craters of Kilauea threatening to erupt at any moment, and the lava flow on the coast not far away. He declared, under the aegis of Pele, the volcano goddess, and before my very eyes, the big island was growing, rising from the depths of a mighty sea. This dynamic relation between land and sea inspired Hawafa to conclude, the world of Oceania is not small, it is grow huge and growing bigger every day. In Hawafa's vision, Oceania comes alive through this intercourse, this love affair, tumultuous as it is to anyone who has witnessed the lava meeting the ocean on this coast, this love affair between land and sea. This paper is a further meditation on this relationship told Malka from the uplands through the history of the national park that lies inland along Hauofa's road. <coughs> In the last 20 years, the state of Hawaii has been faced with rampant overdevelopment of suburbs, hotels, vacation homes, second homes, timeshares, leading to an energy crisis and a call for sustainable energy alternatives. In 1983, the state sought to meet this demand by supporting a geothermal well on Hawaii Island in the Waukeleopuna Rainforest, a state forest reserve, a place associated with Pele, the goddess of volcano and of fire. The Pele Defense Fund, led by indigenous Pele practitioners and allied rainforest conservationists, were successful in shutting down the geothermal project but the issue of geothermal energy is a still, still a live one if we look at recent corporate proposals to the state. 30 years later, the question of indigenous access to resources under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples makes resolving this question even more complex, promising to pit anti and pro-development Hawaiians against one another. The problem of alternative energy remains unresolved despite overseas wars, the now more than a decade long US military expansion in Hawaii to secure these foreign resources is also occurring on sacred lands. A central tension in the face off between the state, the Board of Land and Natural Resources and the Pella Defense Fund centered on an ontological question about the nature of steam. So here is one of those non-living entities and for them it's living as you'll see. For geothermal scientists and industry, es sorry, industry experts, volcanic steam is merely the vaporization of water molecules as a result of contact with the Earth's heat. However, as the Pellet Defense Fund declared, for them steam is an aqua or god, a form of Pele. They said, quote, Pele is the magma, the heat, the vapor, the steam, and the cosmic creation which occur in volcanic eruptions. She is seen in the lava, images of her standing erect, dancing, and extending her arms with her hair flowing into the steam and clouds. Pele appears in special alternate body forms, along with those of her sisters and brothers, their kinolau, their bodily forms, the native fern, the shrub, native shrub, and blossoms of the native trees. Her person, her body spirit, her power mana, her very existence are the lands of Hawaii. Geothermal development, they argued, would adversely affect and injure Pele's sacred body, they declared, and lead her to retaliate. So Pele has incredible agency <laughs> here, right, that scientists don't want to maybe engage with or believe or they reduce it to belief, right? For, but for these guys, it's not about belief. They see it every day. In contrast, geothermal scientists view volcanic steam as a natural resource, potentially almost limitless, that is just waiting to be converted into electrical energy. How did these radically different understandings of the volcano's region come to be? And how can literature help us to find new approaches to this set of problems? As perhaps one of the most celebrated places in all of Hawaii, 
the Kilauea region is the abode of Pele, but it is also circumscribed by the U.S. Department of the Interior as Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. The park could not have been established without annexation to the United States, and one of its prime architects, Lauren Thurston, co-author of San co-author with Sanford B. Dole of the Constitution of the Annexationist Republic of Hawaii, co-owner of the Volcano House, a hotel on the crater rim for 13 years, former Minister of the Interior under the second to the last monarch of Hawaii, and publisher of the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, in whose pages he lobbied for the National Park idea in the territory's early years. He was the prime mover behind the development of the park's three founding institutions, the hotel, the observatory, which is now a USGS um, institution, and the Kilauea military camp. Articulating the long-standing alliance between tourism, science, and the military that has long determined the course of colonization in these islands. Largely through his own efforts, the park was established on what would eventually grow to encompass more than 324,000 acres, a large proportion of which are ceded lands or lands taken during annexation. Through his involvement in these institutions, Thurston attempted to resignify the region and evacuate Pele's genealogical relation to those lands, which had been politically, culturally, and physically central to constituting the kingdom's dynastic claims, plural as they may be. Between 1905 and 1906, the Hawaiian language newspaper, Kana'i Aopuni, which was a, um, a home rule newspaper, was publishing Ho'ulu Ma Hie Hie's Kamo'olelo, the epic tale of Hi'iaka i Kapoli o Pele, Hi'iaka in the bosom of Pele. And I'm going to be calling upon this text uh, and the English translation by recently re released by Puakia Nogomeyer and his team of translators. The battle over the future of these lands, we might say, was fought in the newspapers, annexationist and pro-home rule. In his own newspaper, Thurston brought his readers into this new, bounded, scientized vision in order to legitimize a logic of property over an area that could not actually be contained thusly. For as we know, Pele is continually making more land, more of herself. As I will show, this epic tale contested Thurston's vision through the way it reinvigorates place through the fluidity and multiplicity of the Hawaiian language. But I'd like to first speak to the role of language and what it can tell us about island approaches to the environment. And you'll see why I put quotation on environment. It's an kind of inadequate word for what I'm going to describe. To help us put native languages at the center of interpretation, I turn to historian Noelani Arista, who posits Kauna and Kauna consciousness as, a key, as key to a method centered around um, Hawaiian methodologies. Kauna can be understood simplistically as metaphoric, allegorical, or symbolic meaning. Mary Kavena Pukui from the same essay, Ka'u, uh, Old Melis of Ka'u, says this about Kauna. Many poems did not hold to one thought alone. Two lines might be about the beauty of a particular place and next about a bird uh, that perched on a tree. Such sudden and apparently fickle changes in thought might sound peculiar and jerky to a European. But to the Hawaiians, it was comprehensible because Kauna told the straight consecutive story although dressed in a garb of colors that did not seem to match. Mm. Sorry. Poems were sometimes, persons were sometimes referred to as rains, winds, ferns, trees, birds, ships, and so on. A person might be referred to in the same poem as rain in one place and as wind in another. Arista goes on to define the various ways Kauna is viewed today, while also offering her own definition, which she, she explains as the multiple and sometimes artistically hidden meanings of words, which imply more than just figurative multiplicity. 
So I'm kind of getting to Carla's question this morning about language and ecosystems. I want to uh, move towards an even more material aspect of Kauna, Kauna, so less about figurative and more about the material. When people are compared to rains, winds, ferns, trees, birds, for example, what does this poetic form of referencing tell us about the relationship between people and the natural world? What is the relationship between Kauna, a form of language, and the bodily forms of Akua gods, the Kinolao? steam, for example. My larger goal is to begin to think about kinolao, these forms, bodily forms, as a kind of material genealogy. How might kauna consciousness be a mode of reading the material aspects of genealogy, specifically kinolao, the tangible body forms of gods? What might the multiplicity of kinolao, indeed the innumerable nature of these forms, suggest about how Hawaiians conceived of their relation to the non-human world? And what might Kinulao and the method of Kaona tell us about underlying genealogics of Aina, the logics that structure relation to land? So I'll discuss one example from Ho'ulumahiehie Hie, and that shows how reading with Kaona in mind might provide insights into these questions. Na kino papa lua, environment's queer genealogics. When Pele calls upon um, Hiiaka to seek out her lover, Lohiau, Hiiaka is surfing with her icon, Neho Poe, whom she must leave behind to make her voyage. On her departure, Hiiaka asks Pele to care for her icon while she is gone, since she will be securing Lohiau for Pele. No reciprocity is forthcoming from Pele, and her younger sister departs in annoyance and sadness. Almost immediately, she meets Wahine Oma'o, a young woman who will accompany her, <coughs> her as an ikane. Critics have remarked about the ambiguous sexuality of Hi'iaka and other figures, such as her ikane Ho'opoe. Though the term ikane did denote intense close friendship and sexual relations, it did not according to John Charlot, uh, an expert of Hawaiian um, folklore, designate an exclusively homosexual person. Ho'ulumahiehie, he argues, redefines the ikane as a true friend in times of trouble and dismisses a homosexual or lesbian tradition of pelehi'iaka. My reading will suggest that there may be another way to read the sexual ambiguity of the ikane in this text. When hi'iaka decides that this young woman who she meets, Wahine Oma'o, will be her traveling companion. She tells the story of how she met Ho Poe. At the same time, she gives Wahine Oma'o special powers to see. Oh, those are the names of the characters, so we can, or in one case, is a god, goddess. Okay. Um, she gives her the special powers to, quote, see the dual forms of being supernatural beings of all the many spirits and gods. And the Hawaiian is ake ike na kino papa lua okakopo maokini. Wahine oma'o glimpses hiaka's exposed legs and confesses her desire. This scene is followed by a revelation of the dual forms of the gods, in ca this case, the bird children of Waikoli. Wahine Oma O sees only birds nipping at the ava leaves, a kinolao, but he, she also sees two men, lehua kea, white lehua, and lehua ula, red lehua blossom, also a kinolao of Pele. They are handsome young men standing below a lehua tree, their heads festooned with wreaths of lehua blossoms and their necks heaped with garlands made of hala keys. The significance of this meaning emerges in the two scenes that follow, in which Wahine Oma'o's desire for her companion, Wahine Oma'o, uh, Wahine Oma'o and the bird men, emerge, suggesting the non-exclusively homosexual nature of the ikane that Charlot notes. It is when Wahine Oma'o happens to glimpse Hiiaka's legs that her desire emerges strongly. Um, let's see. 
Okay. I'm starting a little bit farther down in the passage. The calves of this beauty of the crater were left exposed. They moved like the stern of a ship, Mauna Loa, which is a steamship. <laughs> okay. And they resembled a superb wooden prow in size, robustness, and fine rounded form. Wahine Oma'o saw the beauty of her companion and said to herself, with beauty like this, no strong kawila tree of the forest could restrain its roots from growing. Oh my, if I were a man, she would surely be my wife. This is a beauty that all the world will hear about, like tender taro leaves, so delicate to eat up. No man's eyes could avoid arousal at this beauty. The many meanings of kino resonate in this passage. Pukui and Albert define kino. Um, I'll go here first. Um, as body, self, person, receptacle, form, bodily, physical, material, non-spiritual. The text elaborates the varied relationships between these definitions. Body as the receptacle of the spirit in the many scenes of healing. The physique of the men who are forms for the bird children. Hiiaka's legs are compared to the rear portion of a ship, steamship, and to the pointed prow of a boat, suggesting another meaning of kino, hull of a ship. Very odd kind of connections, right? You know, that, that many colored garb. Another kino in this scene is the young taro leaf, the only le food that Hiiaka eats. That Wahino Omao compares her to this food is curious indeed. The term papalua is also of interest. It's in its non-reduplicated form as palua or kinopalua, um, one with dual character or body. Another interpretation of the phrase kinopapalua resonates with the two scenes that follow, wahine oma'o's desire for her aikane as well as for the bird men. Perhaps the ability to see the dual forms suggests Wahine Oma'o's ability to now discern Hiiaka's own dual character or body, indeed, as well as to discern her own dual desire, right? The desire for the men and, and Hiiaka. For it is revealed further on that Hiiaka knew they would come upon the two bird men, which is why she had gathered up the lightning skirt, the Hiiaka skirt, stirring up uh, agitation and desire. Hiiaka then sought to stir up Wahine Oma'o's heterosexual desire for the two men, even while she sought to make her companion aware of the desire for Hiiaka herself. In both instances, Hiiaka warns her aikane about the dangers of actualizing her desire, of rushing toward what the eye beholds. Hiiaka may be advising her friend not to be fooled by physical beauty, However, in the context of the bestowing of special sight, Hiyaka's point moves toward a deeper, more complex understanding of the natural world, namely how one interprets or reads that world, a world full of the beautiful and various forms of kinolao. Hiyaka seeks to instruct her companion in reading what lies beneath the initial surge of desire for a beautiful kino, namely the newly emerging ability to read the trees, birds, and human forms, indeed the porous boundaries between the lehua blossom, the ava, the birds, the men, and the interdependence of these creatures, the birds which depend upon the plants for the nectar, their sustenance, but which also pollinate the blossoms, and the people and forms who depend upon this entire ecosystem for, for their own existence and culture. For as the botanist uh, Dieter Mueller Dambois has showed us, the ohia plant, out of which the lehua blossoms come out, um, that plant is literally the one that transforms barren lava, barren lava, right, into life-giving rainforest. It is the most essential tree in Hawaii. Wahine Oma'o has given, been given the ability to see both the kinolao as well as the gods simultaneously. The scenes of revelation, physical, sexual, and spiritual, are all of a piece. They cannot be extricated from one another. Interestingly, one of the ways Pukui describes kaona is in terms of body and spirit. She says kaona is made up of two meanings, the literal 
and kaona, the inner meaning. The literal is like the body, and the inner meaning is like the spirit, or the thing, the body as the vessel for that spirit. Kaona is that spirit. So there's a kind of kauna, a body and spirit, to the discussion of kino lao itself. Wahine Omao can see both dimensions. Attending to kino lao causes reality to take on a different texture, such that sexual desires, Wahine Omao's for right, hiaka, the bird men, exceed Western notions of sexuality and must be understood in relation to the possibility that beautiful human bodies may be not only receptacles for gods, but also in some ways equivalent and complementary forms to birds, trees, plants, or steam. Thus, Hiiaka is the anthropomorphic character that takes on the physical appearance of a beautiful girl. However, she is also embodied in rain and water, fresh water, as well as various aspects of the forest which are nourished by that water just as the two men under the lehua tree are also the birds who flit among the branches of the trees. Desire here not only crosses the boundary between God and human, but also the Western notion of species, indicating more of a fluid and interdependent continuum. It potentially explodes into multiple forms of expression as various as a God's kinolao. So we are moving far beyond Western notions of sexual expression toward a set of relations governed by actions as various as loving, nourishing, as in eating, healing, caring for, and worshiping. But Hiiaka's rejection of same-sex desire is curious. She says to her companion, Oh, sorry. Make, I'll just read the English part. Make no mistake, we are both of the weaker sex. So it would be no good to succumb to a passion as turbulent as the surging waters of Waiolohia. And the part I want you to look at in the Hawaiian is the underlined part. Okawa mahu no keia aelua. Okay. Nogomeyer translates mahu as being of the weaker sex, suggesting the notion of mahu as weak, flat, or diluted. With slightly different emphasis, mahu, okay, so that's the first meaning. Mahu refers to steam, vapor, fumes, or to steam, suggesting a kinolao of pele, which steams the young taro leaves that hiiaka eats, and which then has the power to heal. The other variation of this in this context is, sorry, mahu which refers to homosexual of either sex or hermaphrodite. The difference between Aikane and Mahu is crucial here, but how do we read the term Mahu in this context? Does it imply the derogatory meanings of this term or does it suggest a closer meaning to Aikane? The overt meaning of Hiiaka's rejection suggests the more derogatory con connotations of the term, yet that she admits that they are both Mahu is an ambiguous admission nonetheless. The kauna that emerges out of this play of similar sounding words points to both an ambiguity as well as a multiplicity of meanings, all of which can be read in this scene. And we should note that in the original newspaper in Hawaiian, the diacritical markings, the emphasis of mahu, mahu, mahu would not have been there. Yeah. So Nogomeyer is, take, is really interpreting at this level when he chooses the first translation, first word. <coughs> and given that the newspapers would have been read aloud provides another possibility for readers and listeners to hear different meanings emerge, different elaborations of kinolao and kauna. And this points to an oral and oral dimension to kauna and to the newspaper text themselves. Okay, so I'm coming toward the end. Sacred role of the Aikane. In the ma many scenes of healing, Hiiaka prays over the bodies of persons thought to be dead or close to death. What most critics fail to note is that the efficacy of her performance of the prayers is revealed in the narrative framing of each prayer. So you have these poetic texts framed by narrative. Yeah? And the efficacy of the prayer is revealed in those narrative framings. In most of these scenes, 
The Aikane Wahine Oma'o supports Iaka's efforts, often helping to gather the needed herbs and assisting in the ritual, which includes attending to Iaka's performance itself. The role of the companion is almost as important as the actual performance of the healer. The companion verifies that the conditions for the efficacy of the prayer have been established and implies the efficacy of the sacred poetic language. We might even say that the healer's sacred language achieves part of its efficacy through interaction with the ikane, just as the chants reveal their efficacy through the narrative framing which weaves and connects the chants together. Kinolao registers, registers a proliferation of forms, the many different forms of the various aqua, or gods, and the proliferation that points to the way sacred places are understood to be constituted physically or ecologically and metaphorically or genealogically through the families of organisms and phenomena. Through the inter intimate interrelationships between various life forms. Indeed, so intimate are these relationships that they are thought of as constituting the same being and the same genealogy. The intimate nature of these relationships cross animal, plant, human divisions in their affirmation of a principle of the proliferation of life and understanding that the preservation and generation of life requires recognizing these interdependent and interrelated life forms. But these relationships are not mere clusters or groupings. The, the woven nature of um, that pukui tells us about, which is central to kaona. The plated nature of these life forms is precisely what constitutes culture and genealogy. We can extrapolate the complexity of one of these relationships in Pua Kanaka Ole Kanahele's brief explanation. And by the way, I should have brought the poster, but actually outside in the lobby. <laughs> Pua, Pua Kanaka Ole, my colleague Amy Stone and I have been working to bring um, Pua's daughter and grandson to campus, and they will actually be here in November this month on the 25th. They'll give us a concert, and on the 26th, she'll be talking about indigenous ecologies and its relation to the hula traditions. We're very fortunate to have them join us um, and share with us their work on these issues. So Pua Kanaka Ole says that the hopoi, um, the figure of Hopoe has many roles. She is Hiaka's Aikane, she is the teacher of hula, and she is the maker of Lei Lehua, the, the Lehua blossom Lei that the dancer wears. Hopoe's name also means fully developed or well-rounded, as in a Lehua blossom in full bloom. But she also has a functional role. Kanahela explains that Hopoe is the physical essence of both Pele and Hi'iaka. She is the ki'i, or the recipient of the god's natural form, movements, the lava flowing, the vegetation returning, which are found in the dance, the ha'af um, style of dancing, which honors those gods through the imitation of their movements. So the dancer, kind of adorned with the lei, becomes the altar, the kuahu, that honors those gods through mirroring their movements by becoming the natural elements through adornment and dance. And this insight is partially, um, Amy Stoneman has helped me to think really deeply about this, her work on hula kuahu. Um, Hopoi, the full-blown lehua, emerges out of the combination of new land, pele, and the revegetation, hi'iaka. She is so she, she's an outgrowth of that, right? She is woven into a lelehua by another form of herself, Hopoe, the lay maker. In her teacherly form, she dances and teaches the dance to Hi'iaka, thus becoming a ki'i or physical essence of the gods by mimicking the movements, one of whom is also someone who is honored through the dance and who is also her ikane. We might say that the hierarchy here is not a Western one in which, the, in which um, hierarchy is determined by a cycle, sorry, in which the higher form, the godly, always remains at this elevated status at all times, 
but rather one in which hierarchy is determined by a cycle of generative honoring regenerative. So it's this kind of s s uh, reciprocal back and forth movement. The way in which culture's role is to facilitate the recycling back into the generative processes. The iconic relationship between Ho'opo and Hi'iaka then is a regenerative relationship, one in which Hi'iaka provides for and inspires Ho'opo's dance, but also one in which Ho'opo teaches Hi'iaka the dance that then pleases her sister Pele, leading to the entire sequence of events that constitute the epic cycle itself, an epic which is fundamentally about regeneration and healing. This regenerative relationship is at the heart of the interdependency and intimacy of genealogics. Okay, the last part, promise. Kinalao and Kauna, analogics. There have been two threads that I have been tracing in my analysis of Ho'oluma here, here. Kinolao, the bodily forms, and Kauna, these linguistic forms, clusters. What is the relationship between the bodily forms and the language that this talk has been tracing? And what can they tell us about Hawaiian conceptualizations of the relationships between people and land? Both Kinolao and Kauna are structured by genealogics, whether it be a cluster or family of related aspects of the land as manifestations of inakua, those Kinolao, various bodily forms, or clusters of seemingly unrelated meanings of words or sets of words, that garb of colors that does not seem to match. The former genealogics of Kinolao connects Aqua to her descendants via the intimately physical aspects of the sacred place, the plants, the animals, the winds, rains, lightning, thunder, steam, etc. of that place. Those Kinolao return to the Aqua through the hula itself the embodied altar of the dancer. The latter, genealogics of Aina, uh, sorry, Kauna, indexes a complex of meanings, a familial cluster that can speak simultaneously in a range of meanings to the reader, hearer, dancer, chanter. Reading both Kinolao and Kauna requires activating and actuating the fabric of these interwoven cultural meanings and play specific genealogical relations that account for the intimate relation of Hawaiians to their sacred places. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our discussant uh, is Stuart Kirsch, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Susan. Professor Najida begins her paper by referring to a standoff between the state of Hawaii and the Pele Defense Fund over a proposed geothermal project that would harness volcanic energy. Opposition to the development turns on questions about the forms taken by the goddess Pele and the life-giving properties of the Hawaiian volcanoes, which gave birth and continue to expand the islands as well as produce the fertile soil responsible for their tropical lushness. Pele is the magma, the heat, the vapor, and the steam of cosmic creation. She is seen in the lava, standing erect, dancing, and extending her arms into the steam and clouds, her hair flowing. This might seem like an old-timey myth to some of you, poetry out of place in the modern state where the agro-industrial giants trial genetically modified crops and the nation's mighty fleets protect the homeland. But Professor Najida goes on to show us how these myths are alive, how they infuse the literary imaginations of Pacific writers and the politics of local activists. Pele lives on in their work. Professor Najida's paper challenges us to consider radically different understandings of volcanoes, of geothermal scientists who view volcanic steam as a limitless natural resource, and native Hawaiians who instead see one of the forms of Pele. As an anthropologist who works on natural resource extraction in the Pacific and the Amazon, the challenge of reconciling radically alternative ontologies 
is familiar terrain. Let me give you two examples from the regions to the east and the west of Hawaii before turning back to the questions raised in today's presentation. According to the myths of the people living in the Amazon, as is the case in many other places across indigenous America, the members of every species think of themselves as persons. They see the members of other species, including humans, as animals. Every species has its own form of human artifacts and activities, such as houses and songs and ceremonies, and to some extent language, although the actual forms they take are very different from their human equivalents. What animals see is determined by their bodies. Although they see the world in the same way as humans, they arrive at very different conclusions because they see other worlds. Thus, what humans see as blood is manioc beer for the jaguar, where the maggots in rotting meat are grilled fish for the vulture. In these societies, a shaman's power comes from the ability to change form, which enables him to see a different world, then return to his own body in order to recount to others what he has seen. In contrast to cultural relativism, in which different cultures are said to provide multiple views of a single underlying reality, the alternative suggested by these myths is that all beings see the world in the same way, as persons do. What changes is the world that they see. Each species sees a different nature than all of the others. There are multiple realities of which only one is ordinarily visible. The Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro calls this perspectivism. <coughs> what would it mean to take the view that there are many possible worlds seriously? What if instead of only one nature and many cultures, there was only one culture, but many different natures? Rather than multiculturalism, we would have to talk about multinaturalism. In Papua New Guinea, where I work, humans and animals are perceived as having comparable powers of agency, including the ability to communicate with each other. The young people with whom I work are adept at recognizing many bird species by their calls. Birds indicate the time of day by their movements and the changing of the seasons by the fruits they eat and their mating patterns. Birds can also identify themselves or speak in Yungum language, like the black-capped lorikeet known as own wheat, which calls out its name, wheat wheat, wheat wheat, wheat wheat, or the bird the Yungum call own calm, which says quee, 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 meaning like that, like that, do it like that. Birds also signal impending misfortune by appearing at the wrong time and place. An owl calling in the village at night means that a sorcerer is on the prowl. Communication between humans and animals moves in both directions. The young gum use magic spells to convey their intentions and desires to the birds, fish, and other animals with whom they share the landscape. In one invocation for hunting pigeons, the hunter addresses the bird directly, calling on it to come forward so that I can see you. I am starving to death, the hunter adds, so do it like that. These spells seek to make visible the hidden potential of the forest. However, they work by means of persuasion, acknowledging the agency of the animals in the forest. They compel, they conjole, they even exaggerate. The spells are based on the assumption that humans and animals comprise a single speech community. Another form of Yungo magic is called komon komon, which changes the way people are seen by others, affording them new powers. Being seen as a bird provides one with a bird's eyes view over the rainforest. This is a power of abstraction, of seeing the world from above in contrast to the way that humans ordinarily make their way through the world. The range of alternative perspectives available through komon komon is not limited to sight. It includes the other senses, such as the ability to overhear whispered conversations like a gecko lizard. It may also provide new capacities to move through the world, such as the ability to swim long distances underwater like a crocodile. Komon Komon offers new perspectives on the world, similar to the ways that technologies like the microscope and the telescope transformed the way the Euro-Americans see the world as well as what they see. From the Yungam point of view, there is no natural world that exists independently of social relations. In contrast to the Euro-American perspective, which assumes that the natural world 
operates according to rules and laws that are independent of human behavior, what the French anthropologist Philippe Descola refers to as naturalism. What if we take these views seriously? The American Indian view of perspectivism, in which there is only one culture but many natures, and the Yungam view, in which there is no nature independent of social relations. Do they have anything of value to say to us in the context of resource extraction? The Peruvian anthropologist Marisol de la Cadena provides us with a provocative example that draws on Viveras de Castro's ideas about multiple worlds. Discussing recent transformations of politics in Andean societies, she notes how indigenous ideas and practices have become more visible and influential in the public domain, including references to Pachamama or earth, earth spirit in speeches and the incorporation of Andean rituals into official events. Debates about new mining projects have also been affected. Indigenous political movements have been gaining influence in these discussions, but more significantly, indigenous understandings of Andean mountain peaks as persons and the need to treat them with respect have come to influence national debates. These interactions can be understood as redefining the notion of the political, which in your American systems is restricted to the social. It is humans who are ordinarily seen as the actors in political systems. But the mountains of the Andes are increasingly recognized as political actors themselves, in the sense that decisions about new mining projects must take the well-being of these other-than-human persons into consideration. De La Cadena refers to this new form of politics as cosmopolitics. A cosmopolitics allows for the nature of different worlds to enter into substantial forms of interaction. She refers to these interactions as pluriversal in contrast to universal forms of politics because they are open to the possibility of multiple worlds. Similarly, when the Yungon people were affected by pollution from the Octetic copper and gold mine, the mining company sought to define the problem in purely technical and scientific terms. In contrast, the Yungon saw pollution as a kind of social relationship between the miners and the people living downstream. Whereas the mining company sought to externalize the cost of production onto the environment and society, the Yungon and their neighbors demanded that the mining company be held accountable for its impacts, sparking a political and legal struggle that has resulted in the transfer of $1.5 billion from the mining company to the Papua New Guineans. Returning to the Hawaiian context, Professor Najida suggests that the generation and preservation of life is dependent on the inter intimate interrelationships that crosses the divisions we take for granted between animals, plants, humans, and the earth itself. She describes how Hawaiian artists and activists seek to bring these understandings to bear on questions of development. Much like the recognition of the non-human personhood of the Andean mountain peak and the extension of social relations into the natural world among the Yungam. These examples suggest that indigenous ontologies are not only relevant to the way that people analyze their own worlds, but can also be pivotal to the interactions between worlds or ways of being. They can provide fresh vantage points on a range of political and economic questions, including concerns about the environmental impacts of development. As the American literary critic Frederick Jameson has observed, it seems to be easier for us today to imagine the thoroughgoing deterioration of the earth and of nature than the breakdown of late capitalism. Perhaps that is due to some weakness in our imaginations. The environmental problems we face today highlight the need for new inspiration. As Professor Najida suggests, we need to think about indigenous knowledge in intercultural terms, to think about the moments of hierophany in which indigenous worlds break through and intersect with other worlds. This is especially true for the vulnerable environments Apelli Hoafa refers to in our Sea of Islands. As Professor Najida suggests, we should understand the efforts of indigenous artists and activists in these terms as the opening up of indigenous knowledge, as points of potential crossover, offering ways to see across worlds from the Amerindian perspective 
and of seeing the world from new perspectives in the Yungam case, and of the intimate interrelationships between life forms in the Hawaiian case, thereby revealing new insights about how to care for our Sea of Islands. Thank you. Who's on duty? Do you want to reply? Okay, make sure that's on. Make sure that, make sure that's on. We'll give you, we'll give you five minutes. Ah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you asked me any questions, Stuart. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, though, because now I get to hear about your work in the Andes. <laughs> no, but I, I appreciate the uh, you're talking about multi-perspective perspectivism and uh, multi-pluralism and um, multinaturalism. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the Hawaii context, we have it in the Pacific, haven't gotten that far that where, you know, Latin America is really way ahead of us in all all spheres in this regard, and I think engaging with um, Gottfried, your 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 kind of inciting us to think across the boundaries between sovereign states and and colon colonized still colonized locations is a real challenge in this regard. And I think you know bringing some of the discussions that are going on in South America and uh, Central America, environmental thinking, um, getting it, getting that kind of indigenous knowledge into political structures is um, one kind of way to think in this, those two, what is it, SIDS and SNIDGES, those two, bringing those two together, you know. Um, Okay, questions. So, thanks, Susan. Um, it's been a really exciting day to hear everyone's work and to hear the kind of broad um, kind of sketches that Godfrey and John provided for us and thinking comparatively about islands. And then now we have a very, very detailed um, uh, you know, example here. And I wanted to ask you about this question about scale because it seems like you started your paper by saying that this is not something that can be extracted from the Hawaiian context, even though there's relevance to it. And I wanted to press you a little more to talk a bit more about this question about genealogy, right? Because I think unlike the context that, and I appreciate your, your comparative, specific comparative context, but um, it seems like there's, there's a lot of different discourses at work here. One is the way of thinking about the human-non-human -human relationship um, and tying it into kind of the new materialism. But the new materialism is a specific, I mean, in my interpretation, is a way of kind of avoiding questions of the sacred. So it's embodying agency and all of this into non-human objects, um, but it circumvents the sacred. But it seems like the work that you're doing, Susan, is very much tied into the sacred and tied into genealogy. So I just wanted to ask you to talk a bit more about that, because it seems like it's the third rail of secular academic um, discussions, um, and, and to talk a bit about the kind of what the genealogy means, which is which outlines a particular kind of epistemology that may not be um, expanded, and, and, and it may not be a point of comparison to other contexts. Yeah. I, I appreciate that question, Liz. Um, I think the, what I've been discovering, at least as I go through the material, um, is that the Hawaiian notion, you know, when we think of Pele, everybody goes, oh, you know, because, oh, no, like, not another, like, like crazy goddess woman who's going to, you know, wreak havoc and destruction. But actually, you know, when you talk to practitioners, Pele practitioners about what Pele is like, they will say that she is um, a nurturing figure, right? She's a, she has her moments, right? But her fundamental, uh, <laughs> do we all, um, all of, fundamentally her role is to 
to perpetuate life and to produce context for life to occur. You know, so the sacred in th this context is very much about um, cultural ways of knowing and practicing that are productive of that those those values. Yeah, and literally of life. So, um, I. Th I think it has to do with maybe reconfiguring how we think about what is sacred, what it is, you know, because, and it's, I think it's at the root of what science, science is about, right, because um, science kind of wants to get away from, wants to kind of provincialize the sacred, right, rather than thinking about what does the sacred allow us, what does it facilitate exactly, right, and we really wouldn't have science if we didn't have those beliefs about or those values that have to do with living life, how to make life possible, you know. So um, at least that's what I've been learning as I look very deeply in one location is, uh, yeah, and I think my students when I teach this material have a little bit of trouble in the beginning thinking about just this fact that what is sacred in a kind of Christian sense or, you know, Western sense is really different in another context. And mm -hmm. if we can make that shift, then there's a lot of points where we can talk cross-culturally and, you know, comparatively, I think. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you to, to both Susan and Stuart. These were really fascinating presentations. And this kind of picks up on something that you just said, Susan, but I guess, Stuart, I like the, the notion of fresh vantage points, especially from someone who's written on the politics of resignation. So I'm glad to see that <laughs> as a, you know, the dominant mood of our late capitalism. But this question is about, so in different ways, both of you talked about shared speech communities, right? I mean, very different ways. But I guess for Susan, this question of um, to what degree does what you have talked about here, this understanding, um, depend upon an understanding of Hawaiian language. And so it's kind of a question about the vantage points and this intercultural communication, the possibilities of translation understood broadly, how and by whom. You mentioned um, artists, Stuart. But I also, in the, in the Hawaiian case, you know, someone who doesn't know much about Hawaii, I was thinking about that New York Times magazine article six months ago, Who's Killing the Hawaiian Monk Seals? I don't know if, if people had read this, but you know, it was about these killings on um, Molokai and Kauai um, of these monk seals, and it was framed by the journalist as this kind of uh, tension between the preserved species and um, Hawaiians who felt angry, like, why is this? Because when a Hawaiian monk seal shows up on a beach, the tapes come out, and everyone has to keep away, and 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 so there had been these killings, and the the I I don't really. I was very curious about the article, but you know, it said about how this elder on Molokai told these everyone knew who had done it, told you know, approached this young man and explained to him that these were in fact Hawaiians because you know the the monk seals have started to come back, especially from places like Nihau, but they hadn't been um, uh, seen by younger generations thought they were not a native species, that they were something kind of new. And so this explanation, th these are your brothers and you have just killed a Hawaiian. And I don't actually know if there's any, you know, so I was curious about that story. But this fact that, you know, in that story, there's this young generation that isn't perceiving this, this interpenetration of worlds. And I wondered, you know, to what degree does it depend on an intimate knowledge of, of Hawaiian language, the kind of things that you're talking about. I, I didn't read the article, but I, I wonder if it says something about um, the way environmental discourse is playing itself out in relation to native communities in Hawaii, you know? So um, it could be that, you know, the protection over the Hawaiian monk seal is viewed as kind of a haole thing. <laughs> No, know? it completely right? is because it's about yeah. how all the the white haoles come out with the tapes and their seal watchers and you know the, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, but I think that this kind of thinking is fairly new in Hawaii. Like maybe in the last eight, less than a decade, it's become more widely known these sorts of things. And the Kanakaole family has been really at the forefront of that thinking. 
kind of a reconceptualizing of epistemology, um, and it is very much rooted in the Hawaiian language, but I think it's possible to understand these logics. That's why I title it genealogics, because I'm focusing more on the logics that underlie these connections, and that's where the potential for the comparisons can occur, I think, you know? Um, so it it's a partial knowledge in a way, right? Because it's this reading is particularly based on one text, and there are many others that could be consulted, you know? Yeah. So no, yeah, thank you. I, I mean, because it was just this question about the translatability to other generations and then beyond what Stuart was talking about, you know, to, to give us fresh vantage points those of us who have no connection to Hawaii or a the Andes, you know, can this teach us something and to what do, I mean, intercultural communications, of course, are very tricky and complicated. Yeah. So yeah. beyond just the formal linguistic. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I'm beginning to be familiar with the concept of uh, breath being sacred, the ha in aloha being sacred. And you made reference to a word that was amb amb ambiguous, but if, when spoken, more ambiguity was added. When the story was told out loud, read from the newspaper, the listener could hear, infer whatever they, meaning they wanted to onto that word because of the ambiguity. And I'm just wondering if there's any connection between a storytelling heritage that allows for more interpretation and that sort of the necessity of the ha, the breath, the sacredness of that? Whoa. You're <laughs> he's in my class. He's taking my class. And he's proof that cross-cultural connections can are very powerful. They, they can transcend the culture. Um, but uh, Amy, you want to take that? <laughs> it's a tough question. It, there's definitely a connection. <laughs> The ha and the well, the, comment. Oh. Yeah. the comment I would uh, offer it, that also responds in part to the last question um, has to do with recognizing the history of colonization and its impact on knowledge and epistemology and the, um, the fact that it has produced a very particular kind of politics of knowledge, who knows what and how, who has access to what kinds of sources of information and how, and what are the different uh, routes of dissemination of knowledge. So the, uh, we are struggling through a situation in the present where the status of knowledge is also in flux because of having been cut off from sources of information and sources of livelihood that uh, were part of the fabric and colon colonization has torn that fabric and we're still uh, mending the quilt, as it were. Can I add something that, um, I mean, I think it goes to the question about development and the potential of people being alienated from their own landscape and the different ways of knowing um, from learning in school versus growing up with and learning from um, one's parents about and interacting with the natural world. And so that these traditions can become weakened and things can become forgotten and lost. and. So that's another risk when we think about development is, is the risks of losing particular kinds of knowledge or becoming more distanced from them. And if we think about the whole point of us being here in Ann Arbor is generating knowledge that we secure so carefully in libraries and archives, I think there's a comparable set of challenges that go along with the relationships to the natural world and, and then also the need to preserve those kinds of relationships. I think the, you know, the kind of following up on, this is Amy Stillman, by the way, she's sitting back, she's there. 
she's our she's um one of the most well known experts on the Hawaiian uh, tradition of hula and mele songs and dance and um but I just want to say that maybe one of the things that contributes to that break or that tearing of the fabric of the culture knowledge and how it's passed down has to do with the ha and how uh, you know the passing down of um, oral traditions has to relies upon living people right and the ha and the breath of life so um, when it's made into a literal form written down in the case of this ta tale um, you know, I think the reason why Puakea Nogomeyer translated it into English is that precisely because of that, the decline, right, in speakers recently, the up uptick in the number of uh, speakers of Hawaiian. But you have a whole generation of people for about 100 years that did not learn the language formally or were learning it in a very um, kind of surreptitious fashion uh, or not at all. So the translation piece into English is vital to that, bringing that knowledge to more people, always knowing that the original is, so he published it in two books, one is in English and one is in Hawaiian, and it's a complete translation of <coughs> um, yeah. John. Um, it occurs to me also that um, the dialogues between species, uh, the d conversations among species that both of you referred to, um, seem to be uh, most intense and most developed in hunter-gatherer situations. Uh, and of course that is... Uh, none, none of these societies are hunter-gatherers. Well... They're all agricultural societies. Well, but... Okay, let's... Okay. Let's put it another way. Uh, the most intense relationships across species are likely to occur in settings, would you agree with this, in which uh, there is a direct relationship between the human and the species, plant, uh, environment uh, that that person is encountering. And I read on the plane out here a new book called uh, The Biophilic City, that the average amount of time spent outdoors by Americans now is five minutes a day. Now, if you want to find a, uh, a source of alienation uh, that uh, does not uh, entirely a part of language, but is uh, certainly uh, an, an existential, experiential uh, dimension, um, I, would, uh, I would take a close look at, at that kind of thing as well. And I, I, do, I won't give up on this. Um, economic business either, uh, whether it's agricultural, fishing, or hunting. Hunting still goes on. Um, there is, um, everything I've read about uh, those cultures who are intensively involved with that, they all have their, they all have their conversations. They all have their conversations with, with other species, with other natures. And it's not the petification of the world that Yi Fu Tuan has talked about. Uh, those relations are intense, they're dangerous, um, and they're also loving and beneficial, like a family. In other words, um, it reproduces that kind of ambivalence. Yeah. Is that true? I guess I would say that with in these, you know, we were talking about agency and history, right? And yeah. trying to be able to detect where agency is. And in these cases, like just like a family, we, we don't choose our family, right? No. We don't choose what <laughs> obligations we have to them, or we, we can, and then, well, you know, you take the <laughs> consequences. But I mean, um, there, right, that reciprocal relation is not one that's governed by agency. It's yeah. governed by what sustains life, right? Of the non-human, what did you call them? Non-human non -person. persons. Yeah, non-human persons, no. other than human persons, yeah. uh, or the human, yeah. So, yeah, I guess I would say that it's not a choice. <laughs> for us, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I yeah. understand. Yeah. As you would say, we're all in the same boat. Uh, 
which is a very uh, marine metaphor, but it's a powerful one. Okay. Uh, we can continue some of this conversation with the next session as well, the, some of the same themes. Um, so thank you to, to Susan and uh, Stuart. <laughs>